In the interview you're about to see, I sat down with two of the recruiting professionals at the Search Solution Group, and we talked all about the recruiting industry. We talked about what's the best time of year to look for a new job. We talked about how Search Solution Group could help you take your career to the next level. We also talked about some stories like what it's like to relocate a horse or, hey, getting free ATVs with the next job. Now, stay tuned for the rest of the interview. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Mitch. What do you do here at this firm? Yeah, I'm a business development manager here at Search Solution Group. So I wholly own and manage the client relationships and I build clients for our company and I partner here with the recruiters internally on every single search to make sure we are delivering the best candidates to our clients. And you, Chrissy? My name is Chrissy Fox. I am a recruiter at Search Solution Group and my job is to really understand what a company needs for hiring and go out and find that person with that skill set, speak to them, qualify them, and I'm really a liaison throughout the entire interview process. Okay, okay. So how did you guys find your way into this profession, like in this industry? Because you know, when I was in college, it's not something that you really hear a lot of people talk about and say, hey, when I graduate, I'm going to go work for a recruiting firm. Yeah. So how did you guys find your way into this industry? I had a friend who worked here at Search Solution Group. At the time, there was only like four employees here. And I was looking. I really kind of missed sales and working for a commission and had talked to her about that. She set me up with an interview here with SSG and really kind of felt strong connections with the people I was interviewing with. And it was kind of a leap of faith um, to change industries, but we're going on five years strong. Nice, nice. Now, I will say, you said something that I think is very interesting, because I don't usually hear a lot of people say, you know, I miss the commission structure, or I miss working for the yeah. commission. Like, what was it about sales that really got you excited, or that you really enjoyed? There's kind of, there was kind of a moment where at my old desk setup, I could see other people's monitors and there's this guy that sat in front of me and I knew he made more money than me. And I had sent him an email asking for something that I needed kind of urgently. And I see him just scrolling on ESPN, oh, wow. like ignoring me basically. And so for me, the idea of really growing a career where you're working for your money what I'm doing directly is going to impact what ends up happening and ultimately my livelihood, my salary, and the money I bring in. So being able to directly have the power over that is super appealing to me. Okay, okay. And that, that, that is a note for everyone out there. So Chrissy really enjoys and she's good at what she does <laughs> and she takes passion. In, and I think that that's something that really gives you the opportunity to really take your career to the next level. So yeah. since coming to this firm, how have you enjoyed the journey or how have you seen yourself grow and change? Oh my God. Um, so when I started here, it was five years ago and I have gotten a lot stronger emotionally. Um, I know we were talking earlier and joking around that I used to cry if something went wrong and it's kind of like after you get kicked in the teeth a couple times, you get stronger and it's not the end of the world. There's other people out there if it doesn't work out with one candidate. And like personal perseverance for me, even more than making money and growing in my career, being like a stronger person where you can have something bad happen at work and then 10 minutes later something great happens and it's a journey. And I think just like as a human being, it's important to realize that and be able to stay even keeled and just kind of keep your grind, keep your focus on what you're doing. If you put in the inputs, you will get the outputs if you keep working hard. Okay. So Mitch, how was your journey and your perseverance? Yeah, you know, I've been here at Search Solution Group for three plus years now, and I started off in a entry level sales role. I actually had a friend who worked here and he referred me to the company and I met with them and I found that I really liked the competitive 
high energy environment. I saw that the harder you work, the more you are rewarded. And I really like that. And so I, I joined the company and throughout the years, I've been able to really grow and expand through finding new clients, um, building new relationships in new states. Uh, I've grown internally and I've worked on a variety of different roles and I've learned a ton about different industries that I didn't know about before joining Search Solution Group. Okay, so where were you before you came here? Before I came here, I was in college. I had a hospitality background while I was working my way through college. And right when I was finishing college, I found Search Solution Group and I knew after meeting with the people and seeing the culture and the environment that it was the right place for me. And that's where I've been since. So how was it, how much of a shock was it to go from a hospitality background to then jumping into a entry level sales position? It was a big change. You know, I put my feet forward. I knew I had a lot to learn. I kept my head down and I worked hard. They told me when I came here to Search Solution Group that if I worked hard and I worked a little bit harder, a little bit longer than the person next to me, that I would be successful. So I gave it a shot and it turns out they were right. And over the years, I've really been able to grow and expand my role here at SSG. So tell us a little bit about SSG as a, as a company. Like I said, both of you have been here for multiple years. Um, you came from somewhere else, and I'm sure you've had options to go other places, but you guys chose to be here. Yeah. What is it about here that makes you keep coming back and makes you want to be a part of the team here? Yeah, so our team is very family oriented and we really are in this together. And I think part of what kind of fosters that is there's not a job that one person is completely working on solo. Mitch and I partner together all the time where Mitch is speaking with the client and negotiating a salary, talking about exactly what they need. I'm working with the candidate. Me and Mitch come together to make it happen. So it's my money, it's Mitch's money, it's the company's money. It's not a solo mission, really, in any regard. And talking things through, every candidate's different, every job is different, so every scenario is different. And being able to talk that through with people who are in the same type of profession as you, like our, our team being a family is why I started, because I really felt a connection with the people I interviewed with. And like I could be really successful by being myself with these people and working hard. Um, so it's their family to me. Okay. And I think that's a very interesting. I mean, because having myself being in accounting and finance yeah. and being in that career path, having, you know, talked with recruiters before of other firms where so you can tell the difference when it's just the recruiter has to put in all the legwork by themselves. But the fact that you guys work with as a team, it's almost like you're telling a candidate, hey, you have a team of people helping you find the next position versus you just have this one recruiter that's out there trying to help you and a million other people find the next But I think that's a very good thing of having a team knowing that, hey, you know what, you have Chrissy and Mitch and probably several other people helping you find that next opportunity. Yeah. So how does that process go? I mean, when a person calls and says, hey, you know, or a person's thinking about, hey, I want to change jobs or I want to see what's out there. Like, what would the process look like for them to get in touch with you guys? Yeah, so they can go on our website. There's a lot of different ways to, to find us searching recruiters, Charlotte. It's always good for me as that's <laughs> popping right up. Um, so getting in touch, I'm always happy to have a conversation. And it can be 10, 15 minutes, like kind of whatever someone has time for where I'm wanting to hear what's their story, where do they see their career going. I'm always thinking what companies would make sense for this person. Say they have a very heavy retail background and that's what they want to stay in. Okay, who are the retailers that would be commutable to them okay. that we could go after and see what they have going on and if they need an accountant right now or maybe next quarter. Okay. Um, so having that introductory conversation and we say we're always keeping our head on a swivel meaning kind of always thinking about where could this person be a match? Who do I know that could fit this role that Mitch has heard about? So having that initial conversation, long story short, have the initial conversation with the recruiter and then we as a team are always brainstorming on where someone could be a fit. Okay, now Mitch, how does the process usually start for you? Like where do you come in in the, the recruiting process? Yeah, so the process really begins with identifying and prospecting a need for our clients. 
So, you know, being in this business for 18 years, we've built a lot of really great relationships with clients here locally and throughout the country. And it all begins with identifying their hiring need and speaking with the client about what exactly they need and then partnering internally and holding each other accountable to find the right candidate and really make sure that that candidate is a fit for the client before we present them back over for the specific position. Okay, so when you talk about your clients, because I think that's an interesting thing about the recruiting business, to where directly you're helping a candidate find a position, but the payment actually comes from the company. So it's like when you guys talk about your client, is it the company that you're placing someone at the client, or is it the person that you're helping get the job the client? Who pays the bills is our client, so that's the company with the hiring need. Thinking about, you know, it's it's a marathon, not a sprint, and I'm always wanting to meet new people and make connections, and if I place you in a job today, in five years, you might need to hire someone, and then you become my client, and we have this relationship over time where the candidate becomes the client, maybe even the client becomes a candidate. If something happens, they're laid off. It goes both ways, so it's really about building relationships, okay. um, but how we make money is by placing someone in this open need. Okay, okay. Now when it comes to like on the business development side of uh, reaching out to new clients or I guess you just finding new clients, how does that process usually look for you? Like if like, hey, there's a new company in town, mm -hmm. they're hiring people, you guys don't have a relationship with, with them yet. So how does that usually work out for you? Yeah. You know, Jeremy built this business 18 years ago from his parents' 800 square foot home in Buffalo. Wow. And the way he did that is he used a rotary phone in the yellow pages to cold call hiring managers and candidates at their desk. And slowly but surely, he built up the company and there's about 80 of us here at our Charlotte headquarters today. And we still use that cold calling method to prospect and bring on new clients and cold call candidates at their desk who are currently working. That's been the way that we've really built the company. We use a lot of grit and we really put a lot of emphasis on that cold call. A lot of great things have come from a cold call in the past. And I think that's one of those R's for someone like me who's in accounting and finance, who's never had to cold call anyone for anything. Um, it's, I think it's one of those things that gets underestimated, like what, how a cold call goes. Like, I mean, because what I hear from some salespeople, cold calling is not for everyone. Um, but when it comes to cold calling, like, how, what was your initial experiences like when you had to do your first cold calls? Yeah, there was absolutely some fear involved with a few of my first cold calls. But slowly but surely, I started to make the cold calls, and I increased the volume, and I continued to increase the volume over time consistently. And throughout that process, I was able to really overcome some of those objections and learn a lot and be able to build relationships with people in different ways. Okay. Now, also on that, like, let's say that there's a company that needs to fill a role, and at the same time they're thinking about, hey, you know, their budget for their business. What are some of the reasons that you would give them, like, hey, you know what, SSG is a great solution to help you with that, even though you have to manage your budget, you have to fill this position. What would be some of the things that you would say to them about why SSG is a great option? Yeah. So here in our office, we are vertical specific. We have about 80 people here and the recruiters specialize in their area of expertise. So Chrissy, for example, works on sales and marketing roles exclusively. There's about five other people here at our firm who work on only sales and marketing roles. And we expand that into other verticals like accounting and finance and HR, operations and supply chain. And those recruiters only work in those areas. So they've been able to build up a candidate base through referrals and through networking over time. And the longer we're in business, the more candidates that we've been in touch with. And while they're currently working, we know that we may be able to call them when there is a hiring need for our clients. So we stay in touch and we do that when our client has that hiring need. Okay. okay. Now, as when you guys talk about building the relationships there, because, I mean, this business is highly relational. Yeah. How do you guys go about expanding your network and constantly, like, what does that look like, building relationships? Yeah. I talk to people all day long. So in any given day, I'm probably talking to 30 or 40 people. And that's not necessarily new contacts or cold calling. A lot of it is keeping up with people and just checking in and seeing how their job is going and... 
keeping people kind of aware of your name and remembering who is out there. That it, I think people like to hear from us after at least a little bit of a relationship is built. The initial cold call, it's cold. And, you know, it's like any relationship where you warm up to each other and it's nice to hear from someone. So checking in regularly. The average person probably talks to maybe five a day. So yeah. <laughs> What is your voice like, and what do you feel like after 30 to 40 people? It's a great question. <laughs> so I drink a lot of coffee um, because I try to be peppy and keep it up uh, for those conversations. And it's hard when I get home, like my husband wants to talk to me, I guess. And, I <laughs> and I've, I've literally been talking all day long. Um, so y you're, only t you're talking on the phone, too, when it's a face-to-face -face interaction. There's a lot more depth to that because okay. you see someone's reactions. It takes extra effort mm -hmm. to have it be a good phone conversation mm -hmm. that's meaningful to both parties. So energy is okay. super important there. Mm -hmm. And my team and colleagues make fun of me and say that I'm super loud. <laughs> and I'm like trying to pump myself up to, to have that energy. So keeping it high energy um, is how I get through it. Okay. And we have fun here. Like I genuinely am having fun and laughing every day. So that helps. Okay. So when you get home, is it just like, you know, I need like an hour of like silence of not talking to anyone? Yeah. I watch a lot of Bravo. Okay. Um, so yeah, I like to zone out, watch Real Housewives and watching stuff like that, true crime, it kind of always makes anything that might have happened or any of your problems seem a little silly. Okay. Now, how about for you on a typical day? I mean, how many people or how many clients, how many conversations are you having? Yeah, I'm having a lot. So I probably spend about an hour, an hour and a half on the phone daily. And a lot of those are long-term relationships where we're talking about a role and the specific details. Some of those are the cold calls, like I mentioned. Now, at the end of the day, sometimes I do go home and I do not want to talk to anyone. <laughs> a lot of times I go home and I uh, read books or I sit on the couch and I uh, sit by myself and I don't talk to anyone for a while. And I take my time to uh, meditate so that I can go back and repeat it the next day. It's probably healthier than watching Real Housewives. <laughs> I do yoga too. <laughs> I mean, we all need our, our thing. I, yes. I, I understand. Well, I don't talk to nearly as, I don't have nearly as many conversations as you guys do. Um, but yeah, when I, it's like at the end of the day, you got to find that thing. And, and for me, at times, it's like going to the gym. Um, and I found with time, it, for me, it ends up working out going early in the morning, yeah. like to prepare for the day. And then in the evening, I don't know, I've been getting into this weird thing with um, when I get home, I want to try some new crazy keto diet. Um, they haven't all been turning out well. Yeah. Some turn out okay. But yeah, but you got to find that thing. Quiet that time. Do. Yeah. So when you guys aren't working on the weekends, and which I do appreciate you guys doing this interview on the weekend. Yeah. What do you do when you're not working? Keep up with the house. I mean, go grocery shopping. I have a puppy. Uh, she's not really a puppy anymore. She's two. But I have a dog, and I take her to the dog park and take her on long walks. And I really try to have quiet time and alone time on weekends. Like, I need to recharge, and I'm a better everything, wife, friend, coworker, if I do take that alone time and recharge. So, like, solo activities, going to the grocery store, going for a walk, just having quiet time to recharge. And then self-care, take a bath, do a face mask, get ready to rock for Monday. <laughs> okay. And how about yourself? How often do you do the bath and face mask? <laughs> <laughs> Not as often as Chrissy. Um, I do spend a lot of my time on the weekends doing things related to outdoors. I love hiking. Yeah. I love the Whitewater Center here locally. I actually learned today that they just opened for the season, so that's exciting. I also have a uh, young golden retriever at the house. He's about 12 weeks, and he takes up a lot of my time okay. on the weekends at this time. And so uh, we're looking forward to uh, some time outdoors and exploring new opportunities and uh, places on the weekends. Now, for your business, do you guys just focus on Charlotte, or do you guys focus on other areas outside of Charlotte? That's a great question. We focus on nationwide. And a lot of our clients will have offices in different states or manufacturing plants. Manufacturing is a big part of our business as far as clients that we work with. So they could have a plant in Iowa and a different plant in Florida, and we could easily work on both of those jobs. Um, so nationwide, and we have made some international 
placements as well. I know we've just made one in Canada, and I know that we've had a couple others sprinkled in too. Okay. So anywhere, anywhere in the country and beyond. So it's been probably like one of your more funnier, or maybe it wasn't so funny in the moment, but when you think yeah. back on it, you're like, hey, you <laughs> know what, that was pretty hilarious. Yeah, you know, building a relationship is very important to us, like we've talked about today. And at one time, we were working with a candidate, and we started working with them around June of this specific year. I remember this specifically because we had just started to get warm weather. And this candidate lived in Texas. And we were interviewing the candidate for a role that was in Dillard, Oregon. And we continued to work with the candidate throughout the process. And we got close to the finish line about 45 days later. And when we got close to the finish line, we were talking to the candidate about relocating in their specific situation. And we found out that they had two horses that they wanted to relocate. And it turns out that was a big deal to relocate two horses across yeah. the country. And the client did not want to pay for the candidate to relocate their horses. But we worked through some things. And we kind of met right in the middle, and they were able to uh, relocate their horses and move up to Dillard, Oregon. I relocated horses, too. That's like, it's a bucket list in recruiting. So, like, at what point in the process do they actually bring up, like, hey, by the way, I have two horses. Like, is it usually at the end, or is that something they usually should bring up in the beginning? That's, like, recruiting best practice. We have to be asking those questions. Okay. And the question wouldn't be, do you have a horse that you want to move with you? But the question is, what does relocation look like? And it's important to know, like, if someone has children and they're moving kind of far away, they're going to need to know about school systems. There's a lot that goes into moving a family. And it's, it's on me to a large degree to ask those questions and know that because it's, it's never a, a good surprise if you're finding out about that stuff later down in the process and the client didn't know about it. That's not something you want to spring on them. So kind of from the jump, like from conversation one, if we're sending someone over and it's not a local opportunity, that's when we start asking what relocation looks like. Mm -hmm. And every time you're talking about how an interview went or prepping someone for an interview, you're needing to circle back and just kind of make sure that you're on the same page have you talked to your husband? Have you looked at any schools in the area? Maybe you should. Um, and just kind of like knowing that stuff. And that's, that's a big part of our job. It's really not just finding the person and sending them on the interview. You have to know this person. And changing jobs, even if it is local, but especially if you're moving your whole family, is a really big life decision that people don't take lightly. So you're kind of like a, a counselor in a way talking through this. and reminding them of the stuff that they need to be thinking about before they make this huge life decision. And if speaking of that, like when you're trying to help, let's say, you know, the person that was in Texas looking at a job in Oregon, like, I um, mean, you guys are in Charlotte, so yeah. what, what tools or what ways do you help them, like, they need to look in the schools or look in the area? I mean, that's when we'd be very reliant on the client and asking them, this guy has two kids. What school systems would you recommend? What are areas? that they might want to consider, they like an urban environment, they want somewhere that's not close to the city. So asking the client, and also a lot of times with a client, we may have placed people with them in the past. So say Mitch had placed someone with a company that I was now about to place someone with, I would ask him to ask the candidate that he placed and just kind of get the inside scoop there. Yeah, and to uh, piggyback off that, cost of living is, is big. It's very different in different places throughout the country. So really understanding that cost of living and knowing the market in the areas is important to talk to the candidate about. And over time, you know, we work in more places and we have more market research on the areas and we know that and we're able to coach the candidates and coach the clients on uh, the right situation for that candidate and the right salary range for the cost of living uh, to come into consideration. What's the benefit of them going with a recruiting firm versus just saying, hey, I'm just going to go out online and apply on my own? I've spoken to the hiring manager. So if you see a, a job posting, there's a ton of information there. Sometimes it's very detailed, but I've, I've had a conversation with them where I'm asking what's the top three things you're looking for, getting more insight on what the hiring manager is like and what the culture is like and what the team breakout would be. We've already had that conversation with the person who's looking for this, so I can relay that information to the candidate and 
give them a lot more information than they would have if they're just applying. And also, applying to job postings can be very much a black hole in a lot of ways. Companies work very differently on how they process applicants, and some are reliant on a software that's screening for certain keywords. So if you don't have that keyword, you're automatically out. Or maybe someone has a lot of other stuff going on, the internal human resources or recruiter, and they're not even looking at applications. So I send someone over, and if I haven't heard back in two days, I'm following up on it, making sure that like if this person isn't a fit, they're going to find out from me, because I'm going to find out from the client versus you send something, you never hear anything, and that's that. And I think that makes a, a big difference. So I would say even in with interviewing for or applying to different jobs to where, or even just being a hiring manager at times when you have a ton of stuff going on. Yeah, it's not necessarily your, your top HR priority. It's like, hey, here are 30 clients for you to review. And it's just like, I don't have time to sort through all 30. And it's like, and, we, and I was, I actually hired someone using an uh, external recruiting firm. And the questions that I wanted to ask, they had asked them already. So yeah. it was a lot easier to go through that profile than to say, hey, here's 30 you need to go through from scratch. Yeah, and we send a resume to our clients, but the body of the email I'm sending over is a summary with some quick bullets of you know, what my conversation was with this person and why I think that they're a good fit and should be considered. So if you don't even want to look at the whole resume and just want to look at those points, it's a quick snapshot of, this is why I think this person would be of interest to you. Okay. Say you're the hiring manager, and then I'm a recruiter and Mitch is the candidate. If Mitch has a question that maybe he doesn't really know how it'll come off to you, he can ask me. And it's kind of a way to like, when you're changing jobs, you almost don't really know what it's going to be like until you're there and until you've been there for a little while. And information's power. So having someone, the recruiter that you're comfortable with and can ask questions to where you don't have to worry about what is the, the hiring manager going to think of this question. And you can have more candid conversations with someone that you've built that relationship with. That's your recruiter that's working with you. And I think that's a very big thing. I've always had mentors tell me, like when I worked at General Electric, they were like, you know, the manager that you work for is probably more important than the actual job that you take. Yeah. Because if you take a, the right job yeah. with the wrong person, um, it might not be a good experience. But it was like, you know, you want to understand, like, who the hiring manager is, and is that a person you actually can see yourself working with? Yeah. And so I think that that makes a really good point of being able to have the inside scoop, because if you're applying on your own, you have absolutely no idea what the hiring manager is like. You yeah. You just know the position. And going into an interview with someone, like, having a heads up that someone's very straightforward, and this is how they ask questions, and... That's how they are. Like, if you have a heads up and that's what you're expecting, it's probably just going to be an easier transition to having a conversation with someone because you know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And now, one of the, I think, it's a common thought that people have is when you think about the recruiting industry, like, you know, they use the name headhunter synonymously. So what is the difference between the solutions that you guys bring and the experience that a candidate would get with you versus working with just a headhunter? That's a good question, yeah. So a lot of times you see internally, they operate the hiring process by recruiting candidates. When I say recruiting candidates, I mean they post the job and they call candidates who apply to the job online. A lot of the times, hiring managers in the talent acquisition internally will get 100 plus candidates who are unqualified and some qualified for the position. But the approach that we take is we will only send our client three to five candidates who are qualified, screened, and vetted for the position. And these are candidates that we've spoken with and already know that they are a fit for the role. So that way we are saving the time uh, in taking that headhunting approach for the hiring manager and their client. I mean, that makes a huge difference. Because like I said, even when I had to hire some roles where it's just like I'm in the middle of, at a time, we were in the middle of wrapping up an acquisition, plus we were raising capital, and I needed to fill a position. At the same time, I didn't have the time to go through 30 different resumes. I'm like, I actually need someone to help shortcut this. Yeah. Like, I need to know who are the best candidates in this group, because I don't have time to do all this and go hire, you know, go sift through 30 resumes. So I think that's a really good point. 
Now, what are some of the tips that you give a candidate when you're like, all right, you're going to have your interview with this company. What are some of the tips that you give them to say, hey, please remember these things? Yeah. So doing research on the company beforehand is really important. It's not good to be asking questions that you could very easily find on the home page of the website. Um, so do your research. Have questions prepared that you are going to want to ask the hiring manager. Because at the end of an interview, especially if it's an on-site meeting or it's towards getting to a potential offer stage, you want to make sure that you as the candidate truly understand the job, truly understand what your responsibilities would be and what you would be doing. So any questions like that, write them down, bring them with you. Don't rely on your memory to get those questions answered. And have them written down so that you can take notes on the answer. If you're talking to someone and explaining something to them and they're listening and nodding, I think like as in someone who has interviewed people and when I'm interviewing someone, if they're taking notes on the answers I'm giving them, that means the world to me and it means that they're really taking in the information and it's important to them in making their decision. So I think taking notes during the interview is really important. Being yourself, um, loosening up a little bit, like no one wants to interview a robot. I don't think that's fun for anyone. Um, human interaction, like like you said, the manager is super important. You want to know that you have some sort of cadence with this person that you're going to be spending so much of your time with. So be yourself, take notes, do your research would be okay. my top three tips. Well, what are some of the ways that you guys have seen like, hey, this is a good way to really test do they really have the technical skills needed for the job? Yeah, I think about a specific example from one of my clients who had a very rigorous and thorough interview process for the candidates and they use star-based interview questions. That's situation, task, action, result. They were specifically asking the candidate questions and looking for the situation, the task at hand, and what action they took in the result of the specific situation and how they solved it. What is a good time of year for me to start looking for my next role? Like, have you guys seen that, hey, you know, there's a particular time of year that's better to start looking Yes and no. So historically, April and June have been really busy months. I think coming up on like the end of a school year is usually a time when like a lot of people are more open to a move. So if you're starting a job search and you do have some flexibility and if I found that right position and it was in a different city, I would pick up and move. And if you have kids like around the end or before a start of a school year would be a good time. And depending on when companies' fiscal years end, which that's different in different companies. Sometimes it's March, sometimes it's the end of the calendar year. So when you're working, like if a person's looking and saying, all right, I want to start looking for my next job, like what do you tell them to kind of set their expectation of the possibility of how, what the time frame may look like? Yeah, um, that's a good question. It really depends on like what I have going on. like. Me, as a recruiter, I have a plate, a recruiting plate of jobs, so I'm working on 20 jobs at any given time. And maybe I'll talk to someone who, they're a brand manager, and that's very much in my wheelhouse of the types of jobs I work on, but I might not have one right then and there. I'll usually have that initial conversation with them and start brainstorming what companies maybe would be interesting to them. And we're always keeping up with our clients or with our future clients that are potentials to see what's going on on their hiring needs. Um, so what was the original question? Was well, how do you set their expectations on yeah. the timeline? So like letting them know that it's something I'll always be keeping an eye out. It's, I only have so much control in the timeline and the process. If I send a candidate for a job, I might hear back that day from the hiring manager or I might hear back a week later. And I'm always following up, but there's only so much I can do to accelerate that timeline. So I let them know that. And I'm always keeping up and uh, trying to check in with candidates and kind of tell them what's going on. But if you haven't heard from me and you want to know what's going on, call me and I'll tell you what's going on. And realistically, I usually tell people the hiring process takes anywhere from four to six weeks because initially you're going to do a phone interview typically and then meet on site and sometimes you might have to fly for that on site. It, every, every scenario is different.
you know, that candidate may have an interview going on with our client's competitor. And so we always want to be coaching our clients to move the process efficiently so that the hiring process is moved up. But we do have an average time to fill of about 45 days. It's right inside that four to six week timeline that Chrissy mentioned. That's another important question, like as a recruiter, for me to keep on top of if someone's actively interviewing with other companies and our client is maybe not moving as quickly. If I know that they're actively interviewing, I'm telling Mitch, and Mitch is telling the client, you might lose this person, you know, if you don't interview them or they might accept another offer elsewhere. Like that's another important thing for the recruiter to know to be able to move things along as quickly as possible. When it comes down to the salary negotiation piece of it, like that, that something that gives a lot of professionals a little bit of anxiety because there's probably, I mean, I think if you're in a professional career and you're going to college, you've probably never taken a course on how to negotiate your salary. Yeah. So what are some of the, the, the ways that you kind of help people understand, like whether it's, hey, here's what the market rate for this type of role is, or like how do you, how do you help them set their expectation for salary ranges? Yeah, I think I'd like to start with saying that with the market being where it's at, at 3.7% unemployment, it's really a candidate's market. So we're always coaching our clients on that, and we're finding out where our candidates are at in terms of compensation in the states that we are allowed to ask that. And then we are always letting our client know what it's going to take for that candidate to make a move. We're having honest and trustworthy conversations with our candidates to find out what they would be looking for to accept that position. And we coach and work with our clients to make that happen for that candidate because it's very important that you bring the person on that you want. Going back to your memorable experience. Yeah. <laughs> what has been one of your memorable, now Mitch talked about trying to relocate two horses. Yes. Like 45 <laughs> days away from actually closing the deal on the job. What has been one of your more memorable experiences? I had a guy who um, lived in my hometown that I grew up in, which is in western Massachusetts, like pretty random place um, to be in Charlotte and, and meet someone who's from there. But he was living there, and I had been talking to him for like three years. I had probably sent him to six different jobs, and he's a good guy, like good candidate, good at his job, just for whatever reason he hadn't been the one for these other jobs. So ultimately, I did place him like three years later. That's definitely pretty memorable. And let's see. I placed a guy with a, a company that makes off-roading vehicles. And we found out during his negotiation process he was going to be getting a motorcycle and a snowmobile for free. So that was kind of cool. It's definitely memorable. Um, so did he ever invite you up to, no, to spin on the I'd have to go to field? Minnesota <laughs> to check that out. Um, so I, I never asked him. Maybe I should. But that one was cool. I've moved horses as well. <sighs> I guess, how does that discussion go? You have to relocate a horse. Like, what's the client's reaction like when you tell them that? It was smooth sailing for me. Um, they were moving to a place where it is kind of farm-esque and probably not, not their first rodeo with something like that. Um, so they were cool with it. If you tell, like I knew from the jump, meaning like when I first talked to this lady that she was open to moving, but yeah, I have two horses that I would need to bring with me. So knowing that early on, I feel like the sooner you know information and share it with the client so there's no surprises, that eliminates any sort of hiccups. It's when they found the person they want to hire and then you spring on them, we need $20,000 to move these horses, that gotcha. that's maybe not as happy making. No, makes sense, makes sense. Now, as we get ready to, to wrap up the interview, one of the things, I, I well, two things that I, I like to ask is, is, first is for your profession as a whole. So let's say there's someone who's considering going into your profession. Like what advice or what things would you tell them like, hey, these are things you probably should consider uh, before making that decision. So if someone said, hey, Chrissy, I, I want to go into your profession, what would you tell them, like, hey, these are things you should consider? Yeah, so I my biggest advice would be, like, keep your head up and keep pushing because there are inevitably going to be things that happen that are disappointing in this profession. 
just like any other profession, you know, there are people that they don't show up to the interview, who knows what's gonna happen, and you just gotta keep powering through. Um, for me, I've been talking on the phone my whole life, right? And spending hours a day doing it. So I joke with my parents that like, I've been training my whole life for this job. <laughs> I was always on the phone with my friends, now I'm just always on the phone with candidates. Um, but it's a lucrative way to make a living and it's fun, you know, you're talking to people and making connections. So tell someone like expect for it to be a position with ups and downs and if you just keep pushing, keep meeting people, the longer that you do it, kind of the easier it gets, not only because you have a network, but it's not the first time that something has happened that wasn't ideal and you know how to handle it. So I feel like recruiting is the type of job where every scenario is gonna be different and you just kind of have to keep your head up and keep pushing through and the rewards and the victories make it worth it. My husband works for the bank and his days are very placid. He doesn't have things fall through and oh, I could have made a placement but I didn't, or I made a placement and yeah. And that comes with good and bad of high highs and low lows, but there's never a dull moment like we said earlier. So just like know that and expect it and that I think makes things a little bit easier. How about for you, Mitch? Yeah, you know, I will say that this is not a nine to five type job. We operate with a lot of innovation and creativity. So if you come into this job with attitude and effort and you put the time in to be successful, there are great mentors, especially here at our company, that are going to show you the right way and really help you to succeed if you utilize them and you put in that attitude and effort. And with that comes reward. It is lucrative, like Chrissy said. So the harder you work, the more you will be rewarded. And there is long-term growth and opportunity in this business. That's a really good point too. And it's, it's like a sales job in the sense that what you put in and the more you put in, the more you'll get out. And it's kind of a numbers game. If I'm working on a job, the more people I talk to, inevitably, the more qualified people I'll talk to. And that is increasing my likelihood that I'm gonna place someone. So it's a numbers game and work hard, do the inputs. If you keep doing what you need to be doing, reaching out to the right number of people, doing your research on the job, like understanding, what you need to be looking for, eventually it will work out. You just have to keep grinding. The grit, the grit is one of our main uh, values and like being able to, to tough things out and keep with it, stick with it and get through it, like that is what you have to do to be okay. successful. And so the last question is, now person's decided, hey, I wanna come into the industry and they're like, hey, I wanna come to this company. Yeah. Like, what would you tell them about specifically working for this company? So, something unique about Search Solution Group is our owner, our CEO, Jeremy Nazo, he started, like Mitch was saying earlier, he started this company by himself in his parents' home. This is his baby. <laughs> it's his 18-year-old baby, but Jeremy's entire life was building this company, and he's made himself a huge success by being a pure entrepreneur, entrepreneur, blood, sweat, and tears to get there. So the boss is the person who came up with the idea, and this is his life. So you have to be like willing to be a part of that. It's not a nine to five. It's not a Monday through Friday. You're part of something that is very important to people's livelihood. So you have to be like up for that. And I think being like able to work alongside the entrepreneur that started your company makes you more invested in it. Jeremy is like family to me and I feel like it's my company too and we're here together every day making it happen and like that type of kind of attachment almost like emotionally to the company, like that's not necessarily something you have everywhere else. And you have to want that, like not everyone does want that and that's okay. That is important to us. So coming in and utilizing that grit and really learning from your mentors is important. And we have a lot of really great tenure here and we have longevity and, and that's something you don't see in a lot of other companies. So that's something that we take pride in and that you can know that you can come here and work long term and really grow and build your career. 
Awesome. Well, I do want to say thank you guys so thank much you. for being on the show. And thank you for taking your time out of your weekend. Because I know you guys have a very, very busy weekend. And thank you for taking time to talk. I know you guys talk all week long. Yes. So thank you for being <laughs> on the show. Thank you. This was a blast. Thank you so much.